Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gideon Rose. I'm the editor of Foreign Affairs, and it is my distinct privilege and honor and pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to the 12th annual Arthur Ross Book Award ceremony today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge and give a warm welcome to Janet Ross, uh, who uh, is the reason we're all here. So as you all know, this award was endowed by Arthur Ross in 2001 to honor nonfiction works in English or in translation that merit special attention for bringing forth new information that changes our understanding of events or problems, developing analytical approaches that allow new and different insights into critical issues, or providing new ideas that help resolve foreign policy problems. Um, in practice, what that has meant is what is the best book uh, in the last year or so uh, that has uh, focused on international affairs, public policy, more generally uh, uh, serious nonfiction that, that changes our view of the world and, and <coughs> how it's constituted and what should be done in it. Uh, this year we had an extraordinary uh, crop. Um, <coughs> and uh, we had five uh, finalists, uh, all of, uh, of which were excellent, excellent books. Um, uh, uh, Darren Asimoglu and James Robinson's Why Nations Fail, uh, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty, Anne Applebaum's Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 44 to 56, Rajiv Chandrasekharan's Little America, The War Within the War for Afghanistan, Michael Gordon and Bernard Trainer's The Endgame, The Inside Story of the Struggle for Iraq from uh, George W. Bush to Barack Obama, and Fred Logeval's Embers of War, the fall of an empire and the making of America's Vietnam. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the committee, uh, the jurors, uh, myself, Bob Kagan, uh, Mary Cerati, uh, and Stephen Walt, uh, as you can imagine, are a pretty diverse group just hearing those names. Uh, we were all struck by uh, uh, how impressive the finalists were and what a pleasure it actually was to, you know, when you get these big giant tomes, um, you, you your heart sinks a little bit because you are duty bound by your uh, 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 professional responsibilities and diligence to actually read the damn things. Um, but uh, they don't always live up to the reputation and so sometimes it's a hard slog doing what we have to do for the field. Uh, this year uh, we actually raced through them and uh, were better for doing so and we all were commenting to each other during the deliberations just how uh, great they were. Uh, Two of the finalists, um, Mick Trainer and, and Michael Gordon's book uh, on Iraq, The Endgame, and uh, Rajiv Chandrasekharan's book, A Little America, uh, had incredible strengths, uh, but ultimately didn't make it into the top three. But I, I want to encourage you to, to look at those and, and read them, uh, and they're really, they were uh, excellent to consider. Uh, in third place, uh, and gaining uh, a $2,500 prize for honorable mention, uh, uh, was Darren Asimoglu and James Robinson's Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. Uh, unfortunately, Darren and James are unable to join us today, but that's a really impressive book and, and definitely worth uh, con strong consideration in your reading, uh, holiday reading. Uh, the silver medal and a prize of $7,500 uh, went to Anne Applebaum uh, for The Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944 to 56. Uh, a spectacular book, uh, which in fact shares many of the same qualities uh, uh, with the, uh, the, the ultimate winner, um, and which actually brought forth an interesting uh, discussion about can we really give the two prop prizes to books that are in many respects very, very similar uh, in their uh, detailed uh, historical uh, qualitative reconstruction of uh, high political events from the 1950s and you know, 1450s and so forth. And the answer was absolutely, because these were the absolute two best books, and so uh, quality is all. Uh, and uh, so even though they were very similar, they, got, they went one, two. Um, and it's a wonderful book. Unfortunately, Anne's also unable to join us today, um, but I definitely encourage you to read that one as well. And the, uh, uh, the winner, uh, the Arthur Ross Book Award gold medal and $15,000. Uh, goes to Fred Logeval for The Embers of War, The Fall of Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam. Before I ask Fred to come up and discuss it uh, with me, uh, let me just say a little bit about the, uh, the book uh, and, and about Fred. Uh, this is one of those books that, that really makes you jealous if you're an award judge because you read it and you say, uh, 
damn, I wish I could write this book. I wish I could have written this book. I'm reading it with pleasure. How is it possible for someone to take such a major topic that we all know so much about and yet add to our knowledge? How is it possible to write with such incredible research uh, showing, but yet still have it be literally a page turner? How can you be a serious diplomatic historian and yet write prose that actually sings on the page? It, it, it's unfair and it's annoying, frankly. <laughs> Uh, what I would say is that the measure of the author of this work is that one could not feel jealous uh, or angry or in any way spiteful or upset about him because he is one of the nicest, the sweetest, the gentlest, the kindest people in the field, and one of the most unassuming creatures around. And uh, it, it is a deep pleasure and honor uh, to, uh, to be able to give him uh, this prize that he so richly uh, deserved. Uh, when he first started on this book, lo these many years ago, uh, and as he was working on it, this was a long time in gestation, uh, he had written another wonderful book on Vietnam about the uh, Kennedy and Johnson administration's uh, decisions and about the early to mid-1960s, the crucial turn of America's uh, in intervention in Vietnam. And uh, when I did my book, on the ending of America's wars and was working intensively on the Nixon uh, policies in Vietnam, I was talking a great deal with Fred, as the country's perhaps leading historian of Vietnam, about the later stages of the war. And we talked about it, and he disagreed with me, but I forgave him for that because he knew so much more than I did uh, about what happened in those years. But I said, you know, you really should write this history of the, the exit from Vietnam, because nobody has made the case that you uh, should be, uh, that, that you can make, and nobody's done it in the way that you could do it. And I know because I'm writing a chapter, but nobody's written the book that, that needs to be written on this. And he said, well, maybe you're right, Kennedy. And instead, what he ended up doing, uh, and had already embarked on, and what he continued to do, was to disregard my advice entirely and write a book on the prehistory rather than the later history. Uh, and uh, I kind of felt like, there wasn't a need for this book because we all know a lot about the French War. We all know a lot about the origins of American uh, involvement in Vietnam. Uh, and yet, when I read it, I finally understood why he had done it and why he had been so passionately devoted to doing it. Um, and uh, my only hope now is that he will, uh, in the greatness of his spirit, uh, follow on to do the third book in the trilogy, as it were, which was not just sort of how we got in and not just the decision to enter, not just the prehistory, not just the decision to get in, but also uh, the ultimate uh, decision to get out, which would make it the definitive three-volume history of America's uh, Vietnam conflict. Um, but uh, in lieu of that later book, we have a discussion on the earlier book today. Um, with that, I'd love to have Fred come up, accept his award, and we can discuss the details of the book in detail. Are we going to have the picture? Are we having the picture? Yes, we're having the picture. Let me give you the, uh, let me present this medal. I think you actually, after, I feel like De Gaulle in the Day of the Jackal. Excellent. Okay, take a seat. I have my copy here. It's marked up. Okay, you got this one. Well, we'll put this here so people can know what we're talking about. You know, Kennedy famously said once on getting uh, an honorary degree uh, from Yale that he now had the best of all possible worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. Uh, this book has been uh, uh, given so many awards and such recognition, uh, you know, the Pulitzer and various other kinds of trivial things, uh, that uh, you can now feel free that it's gotten the real badge of true accomplishment, which is the Arthur Ross Book Award. Uh, and maybe the next edition should have a little doohickey on the cover saying that as well as its Indeed. Pulitzer. Far more discerning honor. Um, so uh, for those people who may not have read the book, uh, why don't we start out by having a very brief summary of what you would say the book is about. Well, it's a book about really how the, the Vietnam struggle happened. Uh, and I, as Gideon mentioned, I worked early in my career on really the Kennedy and Johnson uh, escalation uh, in what I call the long 1964, which was really the summer of 63 under, under Jack Kennedy. Uh, 
to the spring of 65 under Johnson. And I wanted, in, and this was a dissertation, this then became my first book, I wanted to understand why that Americanization of the war happened and whether there were alternatives, not just in the context of, uh, of history, not just in hindsight, but in the context of the time. But in the course of doing that work, I became more and more interested in what came before. And this is also, I think, a function of my teaching Cornell students, well before that UC Santa Barbara students and then Cornell students, this early history. And I came to realize that there was a lot I didn't know about the French War. I also determined that the French War, just in, in narrative terms, seemed to me frightfully interesting uh, and that I could actually do something uh, that had um, scholarly heft but also uh, told a really interesting story. But I think most important is that I thought what I want to do is to give a, a sense of why the French War happened, why it had the outcome that it had. The French were militarily superior to the Viet Minh, uh, and yet the French were defeated. And see the connections, if they existed, between that French War and the American War. And so that's what the book does. It's, it, goes from, it goes from the end of World War I when the future of European empires seemed secure, at least to many people. Through the interwar period, World War II, I argue in the book, is of immense importance to everything that'll happen later in the war. The French War itself, which as I think you all know, lasts from 45 or 46, depending on your terms, to the climactic French defeat at Dien Bien Phu in 54. And then the final part of the book uh, gets the French out and the Americans more fully in. And I end the book with the deaths of two Americans in the summer of 1959, whose names are the first two names on the Vietnam War Memorial. Uh, they were killed in the summer of 59, as I said. Uh, and then I have an epilogue that, that gallops forward through Kennedy and Johnson a little bit. But it's really, really this earlier history to get in. How many of you here knew that Ho Chi Minh was a sous chef to Escoffier? in Paris. <laughs> okay, I'm impressed, actually. I hadn't known that one. And as someone who's an interest in both Vietnam and in uh, uh, Escoffier, I thought that was actually going to be. But the story goes from there all the way to the deaths of Americans in Vietnam. And it is a really, uh, Ho is a really amazing character. Actually, why don't you say a little bit about Ho? You, you lived yeah. with him for a while in writing this book. Well, I certainly did. And um, to, to tell us a little bit about Ho. Well, it's fair to say, if you have not read the book, that it's, uh, in many respects, a sympathetic portrayal. Uh, and I do find him to be an extraordinarily interesting uh, character. Maybe what I'll say here is that he had uh, views of the French colonial overlord that I didn't expect to find when I started my research, and views of the United States that I don't think I expected to find. Uh, he had deep admiration for, for French culture and literature, and had a, I think, complicated view of France and of the French, um, and I write about early in the book his experience in Paris uh, after the end of World War uh, I uh, for two or three years when he is very immersed in Paris life, uh, in the cafes, in writing uh, uh, theater reviews. He even staged a play that closed after just a few days in Paris. But um, he, um, he, had, um, he had what I think a lot of Vietnamese revolutionaries had which is they had a, a deep attachment to this place. And in fact, I think some of them experienced at the moment of great triumph in 54, they experienced feelings that they didn't anticipate they would have, which is something has been lost that is a part of our lives. And it wasn't an altogether um, comfortable feeling for them. I interviewed a few um, um, older Vietnamese who had, been, who had fought against the French and against the Americans. And that's what they said to me that they had grown up with French literature, French poetry, um, French uh, institutions. Um, and it was hard for them to let go, and I think that was true of Ho, even though he also hated the French as, um, as, uh, as the colonial master. He was determined, of course, to win independence. But there was a kind of love-hate, I guess, what I'm suggesting. And with respect to the Americans, um, I think Jack Langeth, who wrote a, a, a fine book called Our Vietnam, and who was reporter for the Times in Saigon. Jack writes about Ho's lifelong admiration for the United States. I think that's an exact quote. I think it's right. 
I think for a long time he thought that the United States would be his ally in his, in his, in his quest for independence. After all, the Americans had been born out of an anti-colonial reaction. He believed what, F what Franklin Roosevelt said during the war about being opposed to the French returning. And even in at least for two or three years after the end of the war, Ho thought, the Americans are going to be with me when push comes to shove. And that's a tragic part of this story. But no question, Gideon, that, that Ho is, is central to the narrative. It's really a book in large part about the French and the Americans. But I do want to do justice to the Vietnamese part of the story, and he's key. Last thing I'll say here is that we also need to be mindful of the losers on the Vietnamese side. And there were nationalists on the Vietnamese side who were not with Ho. Um, they suffered in some respects for their close association with first the French and then the Americans. We can come back to this. But No Dinh Diem, of course, is a very important figure in all of this as well, even if he doesn't rise to, to Ho's, Ho's level of importance. There's a lot of background as to how the story plays out. It, to me, the real sort of the war, essentially, get the, 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 we're on the path to war once the decision is made to allow the French to try to reestablish control. Yes. So, because even if the earlier history had played out the way it had, if that decision hadn't been made, then all things would have been different. Yeah. What is it that happens, and why does the United States, which had initially not been in favor of this, yeah. why does it allow the French or go along with uh, the attempt to reestablish control uh, after World War II? Well, I refer to August of 1945, which I think is a, an absolutely fascinating month. I refer to it in the book as the open moment, because I do believe that the future course of Indochina was anyone's guess at that particular moment. The Germans had been defeated in Europe. Japan was about to formally surrender in Asia. Roosevelt had just passed away. And I believe, and I argue in the book, that Roosevelt went to his grave firmly opposed to a French return. R Truman is still making his way in the White House, doesn't know all that much about foreign affairs, certainly doesn't know very much about Indochina. And I think the most interesting part of this is that the French, and we know this from French archives, the French were fearful that the Americans under Truman would oppose their effort to reclaim Indochina, again in, in August, September of 45. Very fluid picture. So what happens? Uh, well, um, Truman and his advisors feel pressure from the French and from the British. The British, I think, are a very important part of this story to allow the French to return. And of course, they say yes you may reclaim Indochina. And they do it in part because of a skillful diplomacy on the part of the French and the British. A theme in the book is that the, the French uh, military performance is to some extent mixed, but they're really good at diplomacy. Uh, and so they make, they make this sale to the Americans. For their own reasons, the Americans under Truman also believe that they need a strong France in the center of Europe. There's already an emerging set of uh, tensions with the Soviets. The Grand Alliance, as you know, collapses pretty quickly. And I think for reasons that have really nothing to do with Indochina per se, Truman and, his, Truman and his aides say, all right, we don't like colonialism. We really do think its, it's, um, it's, it's day has passed. But we need to allow the French, and we will allow the French to come back. That's a decision that's made um, really over a period of months. I think it's firmly decided upon by the end of 45. <coughs> One of the great things about this book is, as you essentially say in the introduction, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, it tells you how history could have been different and yet why it wasn't. In other words, that uh, it goes over the key turning points and explains what happened while at the same time giving you enough of a sense of the contingency uh, that, that could have entered the story and put things on different tracks. So uh, not all, lots of different options were open, but not all of them were equally probable. And the ones that were followed, there was a reason why they were followed. Yeah. After that decision in late 45, yeah. what are the key turning points in the story that, oh, because one of the things you, 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 one of the things you come away from this book with, right, mm -hmm. is a wonderful sense of just how much we were on tracks yeah. Uh, by the time the American, you know, by the time Kennedy took office, yeah. how deeply the, you know, grooved our policy was and how difficult it would have been to jump off. Yeah. So 
how do you go from a complete contingency or a high contingency in 45 to sort of very tracked policy by, let's say, 60? What are the key turning points? Yeah, the key, I would say turn. the key turn, turning points are the one I've already articulated, 45 and 46, when Truman, Truman and his aides go down this path. And by the way, I would say that even then, and this is critical to me as a historian, even then, in late 45 and 46, there are voices within the American government, not just FDR until his death, but others who say, don't do this. We are on the wrong side of history. We're going to pay if we support the French for this. But they make that, this, this decision. So that's a turning point. A decision in, in, in early 1950, after, the, after Mao's forces, Mao Zedong's forces had, uh, have emerged victorious in China, a decision to formally back the French with much more uh, military hardware and other kinds of assistance by the Truman administration is a second key turning point. Because what happens after the spring of 50, and, you, and it's fascinating to look at this, over a period of a couple of years, <laughs> gradually the Americans become more committed to the French war than the French are themselves. So that by the time we get into 53, which is now Eisenhower, who is interesting in his own right, Eisenhower and Dulles, by the time we get into to the early part of 53, the French, in so many words, are saying to the Americans, we want to negotiate our way out of this thing. This is a dirty war, as they say. And, and you guys, after all, are negotiating with communists in Korea. Why can't we negotiate with communists in, in Indochina? The Americans, in effect, say no. Uh, we're supporting you with this thing, you need to prevail. One of the arguments they make is that, in fact, Indochina, in strategic terms, is more important than Korea. And that's why we need you to, to do this. And the French stay in. So I would say 50 is crucial. 54, obviously, with the French defeat. Eisenhower and Dulles make a really important decision to, to, to build up this independent South Vietnam. Could that have gone differently? Yes, although maybe the more interesting possibility there is 56 as a turning point. In 56, as you know, Gideon, there were supposed to be elections for reunification. This was in the Geneva Accords that the French um, signed in 54. I think uh, a very plausible counterfactual, what if, is had the United States allowed those national elections to occur, and everybody agreed that Ho Chi Minh would win those elections, uh, I think you could have avoided, obviously, everything that happened later. You could have established uh, uh, an American uh, presence, strengthened the American presence in more, shall we say, hospitable terrain in Thailand, in the Philippines, elsewhere. And again, this was something that was actually discussed at the time, which, which matters a great deal to me uh, as a historian. The, 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 the other thing I would add into this mix right here is, is the figure of John F. Kennedy. I opened the book with Kennedy's visit to Indochina in 51. He's 34 years old. He's there with Bobby and Patricia. He's on an around-the-world tour because he's running for this, he, he's, he's intending to run for the Senate the next year, or at least his father is intending for him to run for the Senate the next year. But Kennedy, even now in 51, is raising all the right questions, asking prescient questions about whether the French or, by extension, any Western power can prevail in Indochina. And yet, as we all know, in a, a decade later, um, he, as president, begins to oversee a large-scale escalation of the war. So the last thing I would say, Gideon, on your question, is that how we get from here to there, which is Gideon's question, I don't think we can understand the American war in Vietnam without due attention to domestic politics. I think one thing that begins to happen, especially after the so-called fall of China, so-called loss of China, is that with the McCarthy period, but even long after McCarthy has passed from the scene, politicians and Democrats in particular feel, um, feel a, um, a sense of, of, of importance, uh, attach a sense, a sense of importance to the Indochina story that I don't think privately they actually felt. I would go as far as to say that, not, and Gideon may disagree, especially about the, the last figure I'm going to name, for all three, I don't think that any of the three presidents who dealt with Vietnam in, in a central way, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, I don't think that as presidents, we can talk about their pre-presidential years, 
I don't think as presidents they were true believers on Vietnam and on its importance. Therefore, I think that the, the domestic political uh, imperatives are critical. My reading of Nixon, by the way, is that he was ambivalent and that you can see different things at different times. I think there's one Fair. classic exchange in which he actually asks Kissinger, can we get away with it if it goes? And you get the sense of somebody actually asking this question because he's not sure he wants to hear the end. You know, he, he, he's trying to debate just how connected we have to be. And, you know, and when, he say, when he's asking, can we get away with it, do you think he means in domestic terms or is it more in terms of credibility on the, on the world? I basis? see it as the globe. But, okay. yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but we can, again, that's why I want you to write the book. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there's a lot of revisionism and uh, historical speculation of various kinds about both of the American and the uh, uh, French wars. Was, in your opinion, there anything that the French could have done in terms of strategy or tactics, if, as long as they had kept their basic goal the same? Mm -hmm. Could different military tactics, could a different strategy have uh, produced a different result? Or was it essentially foregone from the beginning of the decision to try to reestablish control? It's a really good question. Um, I do believe, and I suggest this toward the latter part of the book, I do, be I do believe that the outcome at Dien Bien Phu could have been different. And the battle was extremely important, as I think we all know. Uh, and I think that, in fact, the Viet Minh came very close to defeat at, Di at Dien Bien Phu. And therefore, the, the rather pregnant question in historical terms of a possible American aerial intervention in the spring of 54 to save the French garrison takes on, I think, great historical importance. Uh, I think that the Viet Minh were on the ropes, and they were as desperate for a truce uh, later as, um, as, the, as the French were. That suggests that uh, there are opportunities. I would also say that the French Expeditionary Corps fought quite well. There was a common view among Americans, which went something like this. We really have nothing to learn from the French war, because the French are a decadent people. Uh, they were vainly trying to prop up a fading colonial empire. We don't have that problem. The Vietnamese will have something to fight for. Moreover, the French were lousy on the battlefield. Um, we, on the other hand, have the greatest military power in the history of the world. Uh, and so forth. I think they undersold what the French did. The deeper answer, or the, 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 the more fundamental answer to your question, Gideon, is that I don't think that anything the French could have done would have staved off ultimate defeat. They didn't have enough manpower, and they weren't going to have enough manpower to be able to commit to this place so far from metropolitan France. They did, the, the various um, I guess I can call them puppet governments. The various governments that supported the French didn't have remotely enough popular support to, to, to do this. But I think what you could have seen, and, and it could have had implications for the nature of the peace, you could have seen Dien Bien Phu held in 54 until the beginning of the monsoon, at which point Z General Zapp would have had to call a halt. It could have had imp interesting implications. The ultimate result is the same. By implication and extension, do you think the same was true about the American War? I think so at the end of the day. Of course, there's a lot of, as you know, um, a, a lot of debate about this still among scholars and other authors. Um, and would an alternative strategy have worked for the Americans or a better application of Westmoreland's strategy? Um, I, I don't think so. I, I, I say in the beginning of the book that it's not impossible to imagine it's not impossible to imagine South Vietnam surviving South Korea style into the, indef into the indefinite future. But the next sentence goes something like this, but it's also not easy to imagine that outcome. So uh, I, think, I think for me uh, the ultimate answer is no. I say in a, in a different piece, which I actually published in Foreign Affairs, of course. toward the end of that piece I say that the South Vietnamese faced an insoluble dilemma. And this, the smarter South Vietnamese understood this. The dilemma was this. We can't win without the Americans, and we can't win with the Americans. Uh, I think there's a lot of truth in that, that as long as you were as beholden to the Americans as you were, um, and as long as you faced the kind of determined foe as you, that you did in, the North Vietnamese, uh, in, in North Vietnam, uh, you and I have discussed before, you know, uh, 
the importance of the sanctuaries and, and the particular geography and, and, the, and the difficulty that that um, um, meant, played. Uh, but I think that, that at the end of the day, that dilemma is, is key. Let me press you on the North Vietnamese. So if you keep everything on the French side and or the American side constant, mm -hmm. uh, but you vary the opponent, could it have worked? In other words, how much of this was the extraordinary passion, devotion, military skill, endurance, will to suffer, everything on the, uh, the, the, the Vietnamese side of this. You know, when I look at these histories, I, I think, mm -hmm. gee, if you replaced this with, you know, part of the problem in judging these things is that the same strategy could have worked on a different opponent. If you had a less world-class yeah. enemy, uh, the same policies might well have worked, I think, and they, that one of the failures was not recognizing, and maybe you couldn't recognize this at the time, that you happened to be up against some of the wiliest, some of the most passionate, some of the most willing to endure people around. Um, do you get that sense, which is, is, are the Vietnamese, not just the Western powers trying to suppress them or mm -hmm. direct their destiny, but do the, the Vietnamese agents in this story deserve credit as extraordinary uh, people who, who, in effect, earned their own destiny rather than just having it uh, be the product of mistakes on the other side. Oh, no question. I, mean, I think you've articulated it very well. I wouldn't disagree with anything you've said. I think it's um, it's crucial to this, and to to consider the the counterfactual here. Uh, I do think that a different uh, adversary. Uh, it could have it could have been it could have been quite different. I think we need to think about this in two ways. There is in addition to the North Vietnamese. Um, uh, there is also the insurgency in the South. And there's a long, as I think you all know, scholarly debate that continues to this day about the nature of that Southern insurgency. To what extent was it truly indigenous? To what extent was it wholly directed by the North? But one of the problems here that the South Vietnamese and the Americans face is that they have determined opposition, I think it's fair to say, in the South and also in the North. But I, you know, I think that if we look at No Din Diem, who's a very interesting character, He's the leader of South Vietnam from 54 until his death in a U.S.-backed um, coup in 63, just three days before Kennedy's own assassination. Ziem is in some ways a rather remarkable character. He has, he's uh, uh, a committed patriot. He's personally very uh, pat uh, courageous. He has his own vision for South Vietnam's future that is really quite developed. Uh, he had shortcomings severe shortcomings as a leader. But I do think that in a, against a different foe, against a different adversary, as I suggested earlier, one can imagine South Vietnam uh, surviving, if not until today, at least beyond uh, the spring of 75. One of the things that struck me reading all the finalists this year uh, in sequence uh, was how all of them were ultimately about the same thing, uh, which was what could be institutions and what could be done uh, to promote them uh, or foster them. Uh, three of the books out of the five were about failed American attempts to uh, redirect the institutional course of foreign polities. Uh, uh, Fred's uh, book on Vietnam, uh, uh, Mick Gordon, uh, sorry, Mick Trainer and, and uh, uh, Michael Gordon's book on Iraq and uh, Rajiv uh, Chandrasekharan's book on Afghanistan. And reading those three of those books in sequence was, you know, you talk about sort of deja vu all over again. It really was uh, astonishing. Um, uh, one of the books, the Asimoglu and Robinson, was a general study of institutions, which concludes, uh, I'll give away the punchline, which is they're very, very important, but we don't really know that much about how to get them going. Uh, uh, and Anne's book, uh, and Applebaum's book, was the sort of opposite side of this, which is here's how the Soviets managed to create strong, durable institutions in their own image in Eastern Europe after World War II. And the short answer there is you make it a totalitarian project and you fully get behind it and you can actually create something that, you know, will endure for several decades. It may not be what you want uh, or very nice, but it can be done. Um, so this question, the larger question of if you are not prepared to go to Soviet lengths and literally create a totalitarian system in your proxy country, in your local client, 
is it possible to intervene in some kind of relatively benign way? Uh, because unlike the, uh, the previous colonial efforts, the American of colonial attempts, at least in the mid-20th century on, have generally been benignly inspired, I would argue, mm -hmm. uh, but they still haven't worked. Yeah. Is it possible even to direct or redirect a country's course from the outside, the way we tried to do in all these different countries? That's a, that's a good question. The, the, the historian in me wants to beg off by saying that, unlike political scientists, <laughs> um, you know, we focus, we go from the particular to the general, and, and, and so I'm, I, I'm, I'm reluctant in a way to draw large conclusions. But I would say this, uh, uh, Gideon, that it's, it's extremely difficult to do. And one reason I think it's difficult in whatever context, is that it's hard, it seems to me, for a, uh, let's say, an let's call them an indigenous peoples, an indigenous people. It's hard for them to see a, a foreign occupying army as their friend. Uh, and I, I just think it's, it's extremely difficult in any, um, in any setting to come in, if you're the, let's say that you're the United States in this case, and believe, even if it's through benign institutions, even if it's through building schoolhouses and roads and hospitals, uh, and focusing on the hearts and minds, as the phrase goes, that you're going to have lasting support on the part of the people there. Uh, I just think that's a really difficult <coughs> challenge. Uh, I also think that um, what has happened too often, and I, I'm not prepared to say that there is a, a, a close correlation, but is that, and, and the, the examples that you bring to mind uh, strengthen this, it seems to me, that you have, for example, in, uh, in say, the late 1960s in Vietnam under Chu and Karzai in Afghanistan more recently. You have governments that do not have, it seems to me, broad, broad popular backing, that have, uh, that have uh, difficulty maintaining stability and security in the country, that are corrupt to, to one degree or another, that are very dependent on that American uh, assistance, that makes it just really hard to, to pull this off. Uh, it's a partial answer to your question. I'm tempted, Gideon, to throw it back to you because you've read these books, you've thought a lot about this. Do you think, it's, do you it's think it can be done? Longer question for another day. Yeah. Uh, have you read the Applebaum book, though? You should, because if you haven't, because it, it literally is the same era, and it's a reverse case in which it's about the construction of a horrible but durable, at least for a while, system in another uh, part of the world. Which, on its own terms, is successful. It works. On its own terms, yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. They, they fun fundamentally totalitarianize Eastern Europe and lock it in for several decades. It takes, it takes till 89 for that one to crack. Which begs the question, I suppose, if that's what's required. Exactly. That was the, that's what I took out of it, which is, gee, if you have to be the Soviets, then it's not worth the game. Yeah. But, it's, but they, it's an open question. Um, before, uh, there are a lot of people here who know a lot more, certainly than me, almost as much as you about these questions. Uh, many of them lived it. Uh, I want to get a, the discussion to them. Uh, but first, uh, let me just take a little bit on methodology and, and disciplinary politics, because uh, the people in this room may not know this, but uh, Fred is a little bit, uh, he's, he's a sort of stodgy fuddy-duddy in academic terms. He's like a coelacanth, one of those weird prehistoric creatures that's still found floating around in today's waters, even though I the rest of them are extinct. Compared. Okay, all right, um, that's good. So, one of the things that, that struck us, again, on the jury this, this year was uh, the wealth and, and great virtues of what you might call traditional diplomatic history uh, in a very classic way. This is a very old-fashioned book in a, in a very good sense. Um, your field is dying. Uh, diplomatic history uh, is, is dying in America. Uh, is, this is like a late flowering of a, of a field under stress. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but they don't know this. So this is an opportunity. Uh, how difficult is it? Uh, first of all, explain, explain what I'm talking yeah. about. And second of all, explain how you could manage to sort of go against the tides in the academy to conceive of and execute a book like this. Well, I, I suppose I should say first that um, I don't want you to think that the field is dying, <laughs> not, notwithstanding Gideon's point. Uh, and I maybe need to say that because uh, 
On January 1st, I become president of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations. <laughs> the leading diplomatic so historian institution. This, which is our diplomatic historians organization. So by golly, I believe in the field. Uh, um, I, think, I think, though, that Gideon makes a, a very fair point, that the field has gone in a different direction. Uh, what direction is that? It's a history direction, in general. Uh, the, the history field in general, but certainly this particular one is one that seeks in many cases to, to decenter the United States, to give, as, his, as scholars like to say, agency to other uh, players in the story, to focus less on state-to-state -state relations, uh, to talk more about culture and to talk more about, uh, to write more in terms of transnational history that has less to do with uh, with high politics and with, uh, with governments. Uh, I think much of this work is actually quite interesting, and I think even among those who write what we might call traditional diplomatic history, um, there is um, a, a growing s attachment to international history and to making sure that we are not only focusing on decisions as made in Washington. In this case, this is an example, I think, of international history. So in the, it's not wholly there for a kind of throwback book. So explain what that means, by the way. What archives did you consult? Uh, by the way, the difference between someone like this and someone like me, the historian and the, and the political scientist, is that we read their books, and we do a little bit of archival stuff when we can, uh, but we claim to be really taking our time to explain the story, and they claim to be actually sort of finding out what actually happened. And so the, if, if you can't trace it to some sort of actual primary source, it might as well not have existed, and you can't take anybody else's word for that. So you've got to do all the damn primary source stuff yourself. So what archives did you visit? Uh, a whole slew of uh, archives in this country. The, the French materials, for anybody who's interested, the French materials are an absolute gold mine. And it helps that some of them are in Aix-en-Provence. <laughs> Not that, not that Paris isn't lovely, too. So, so uh, the French archives, uh, I had some of my best research in England at what I still lovingly refer to as the public record office, which is what they should still call it. For some reason, the Brits decided we should call it what everybody else calls it, so it's now the National Archives. But it's in Kew Gardens, you know, easily accessible on the, on the, uh, on the subway, the tube. And uh, a smattering of Vietnamese documents, although you, make, you raise an important question, we do not have nearly the kind of access that we should have to Vietnamese materials. And it's funny in a way, because the Vietnamese beat the French, they beat the Americans, or at least fought them to a standstill. You'd think that they would be okay with opening up their uh, materials, but they have been unwilling to do it, certainly for the period of the American War, but even the period that I'm in describing in here, the top stuff, Politburo stuff is not available. Now, they were in the jungle. Ho Chi Minh would carry his, his typewriter around. They had to move from headquarters to headquarters. There may be fewer documents than in my mind's eye I'm imagining. But nevertheless, I wish we had, and I would, would say that the Vietnamese should release more of this uh, stuff. Um, and then a smattering of materials from, from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, various other countries as well. And then, of course, memoirs, secondary sources, newspapers. Uh, very important research. Last thing I just want to say on this question. Um, I do think it's fair to say, going back to Gideon's uh, original question here, this is not the kind of book I could have written in graduate school. Why? For the reason Gideon said. I think there is a belief, and I think this is unfortunate, there is a belief uh, that this kind of more traditional study. Ah, so uh, you had to ascend to a status in the field where you could buck the trends in order to be able to write this book. Yes, if I, ah, if I want a tenure-track job, Method. if you want to remain in academia, and not all Method. PhD students do, if you're interested in, in getting a PhD and then being a journalist or, uh, or doing something else, then by all means you could do this. Because uh, as a doctoral advisor, I would allow this. But I must confess to you that I would, I would recommend to one of my doctoral advisees not to do this. that they wouldn't do this. Okay, book. so that's what I was saying, by the way. This book, which won the Pulitzer Prize, which won uh, the Arthur Ross Book Award, uh, which is a spectacular contribution, if he had published it as a dissertation, he would not have gotten a job in history department today. Is that true? Is that, that what you think? Uh, uh, okay, there you have it. A policy school, maybe, which is interesting, but not a history department. Okay, <coughs> with that, let me turn. Uh, well, last question. How many years did you uh, work on this book? Well, my, my, my wonderful editor is seated to my left, uh, and that's David Ebershoff. And uh, David can probably tell you 
uh, the exact number of years, months, and days. But suffice it to say that, from, uh, that in, in, in meaningful terms, in terms of when I began the research in a serious way, to when I submitted a finished version, and then we had some editing to do and so forth, it's about a decade. Uh, and I didn't work on it continuously. I wrote another book in the interval uh, that I didn't tell David very much about. <laughs> Uh, and then we moved across the country, but it's about a, it's, it's a tenure. Okay, actually one more last question. David, who gets credit for the writing, him or you? Okay, that's what editors are supposed to say, by the way. We don't always mean it, but in this case, I think it's too much for the writing to have come from the outside, so yeah, impressive Yeah, although the, on, even, on edi <laughs> even on style and, and on substance, fantastic editing from David. Um, with that, let me turn it over to Q&A. Uh, uh, I'm going to call on you, Stan, state your name. Uh, we'll give you the mic. Uh, keep questions short. This is on the record. Uh, and uh, so yes, right up here, first question here. Steven Schlesinger from the Century Foundation. Uh, first question, did, did Ho try to reach the Americans in 1945 and request some sort of meeting for, with them? I had heard something along those lines. And f also, when Ho became an elderly man, was he shoved aside by his own government in terms of uh, his power? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so on the first question, Ho tried to reach the Americans. He started in 1919 when he rented a morning coat and tried to get an audience with Woodrow Wilson at Versailles and failed. Uh, uh, and in 45, 46, he wrote at least seven, possibly as many as nine letters to Harry Truman. Uh, in which he requested support from the United States, referred to the Declaration of Independence. And by the way, in his own declaration, he borrowed from the American. Uh, and that was a kind of, well, it was in part a play for support from Washington. Those letters obviously were not answered. So yes, he tried to get support, and I, I believe until as late as 48, 49, he really hoped and believed that ultimately the, the Americans would come to see what he was doing. The Americans had given independence to the Philippines. He attached a lot of importance to that. The Americans had basically forced the Dutch to give up the game in Indonesia. That, he thought, was a great sign. And he believed, maybe naively, that now it's going to be uh, um, uh, our turn. On your second question, no question that, uh, that Ho became uh, increasingly marginalized, beginning already in the mid-50s in a serious way. And the figure who becomes critical is Les Zwan, who becomes then, little by little, with certain periods of, of jockeying and um, uncertainty, becomes, uh, I, certainly by the time you get into the American War, the, the key player. Ho, however, we should be careful not to underestimate his continuing importance because Ho remained a very important diplomatic figure for Hanoi. Uh, he had great symbolic importance. I, as far as I can tell, the leadership did not want to go and make decisions that were wholly against his positions, and he was often consulted. So I think sometimes in the more recent literature we exaggerate the degree to which he becomes marginalized. It also ebbs and flows. I think there's more we're learning more that there is infighting in the, Viet in the Hanoi leadership uh, and that there are periods when uh, he is in the ascendancy. By the way, he is considered kind of a moderate within that leadership and other times when they are very much shoved to the side. But long before his death, um, he is a kind of uh, father figure in the government. Yes, over here. Uh, oh, right. Here behind you, Oops. Uh, Frederick. Um, uh, as you're very much aware, and I became very much aware, of course, when I covered the war on the ground. Could you identify yourself, Seymour? Uh, Seymour Topping, Thank Columbia you. University. For the record, um, there was an enormous amount of aid given to um, uh, the Viet Minh to Ho by the Chinese mm -hmm. in terms of arms, mm -hmm. training, and also strategic uh, guidance, and even in the field, uh, the advisors uh, that was uh, with them. If the Chinese had not given that aid mm -hmm. to uh, Ho Chi Minh, mm 
do you think there is any possibility that the French could have uh, survived mm -hmm. uh, and, in a sense, uh, won the war? Um, it's a very good question, Mr. Topping. I would say that it bears keeping in mind that in the fall of 1949, in a, it, well, let's take the whole year of 1949, uh, the Viet Minh are making steady gains, especially in Tonkin, Tonkin being the northern part of, 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 of Vietnam. Also in the extreme south of Cochin, China, uh, um, the Viet Minh are making gains before this Chinese aid begins to flow. And you can see in the French documentation growing despair, or at least growing uh, concern on the part of commanders, that the odds are, the time is not with us on this thing, uh, and that, that we face a very long road ahead. So that could suggest that even without that Chinese aid, uh, the odds are against the French. That said, as you indicate, Chinese assistance is of monumental importance especially after the American aid begins to flow in, in large amounts to the, to, to the French. So if you separate this out, if you, if you imagine that the American aid comes even without the Chinese aid, then I think it's a very difficult task indeed for Ho Chi Minh and his, and his subordinate commanders. But of course, part of the reason why the Americans up their aid so much is precisely because the Chinese have extended di diplomatic recognition to, to, to the DRV. And the, and the Soviets have done the same, and they've begun to funnel these uh, materials to the, to, to, to the, to the revolution. So it's kind of hard to separate those out. I think, I guess what I'm suggesting is this. In the absence of large-scale American assistance to the French, uh, the Viet Minh, at least in the, in the short term, cannot win this thing militarily. But if, if, we, if we don't have that corresponding American assistance, then I think, uh, I, I think that ultimately the Viet Minh prevail anyway. That's what, that would be my guess. Okay. Yes, over here. Carol Artijani from Global Kids. Um, could you speak a little bit more about the voices of dissent? Because there were dissenters from the very beginning oh, yeah. in this country, um, in academe, yeah. politics, and in the public. And why is it that they had so little influence in the long run? Well, and then they changed. So yeah. we know there was a change. But uh, I'd be really interested in knowing more about what happened to them. Yeah. It's a very, very good question. And there are, as you say, from the very start, people who are, uh, and here I think there's an interesting comparison between France and the United States. In both countries, there are voices of dissent um, and, from, and, and skepticism from a very early point. Inside as well as outside the, in the system. Inside as well as outside the system. Um, uh, you know, it, part of the answer is an easy one. I mean, it'll sound flippant, but it's not, uh, I don't mean it that way. And that is that there are simply not enough of them. That in positions of, of power in the, f in the succession of French governments in the, f in the Fourth Republic, uh, the, the key voices are always those who are saying, no, we need to press ahead. We need to add a little bit more to this, and we can prevail. Ho is on the ropes. He's struggling. We know we can do this. We're going to build up the Vietnamese uh, indigenous army, the Vietnamese national army, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the easy, but also I think an important part of the answer is that there were not enough of them. Um, moreover, I would say this, and this is a theme in the book, and this is something that I think is interesting even in terms of our present day. I think what you find in the French case and in the American case uh, is that, and maybe this is part of human nature, I'd be interested to know if you agree, that it's, it's difficult for policymakers to acknowledge a mistake, to, to, to convince themselves and each other, you know, we went down the wrong road, we're going to pull back. Um, I, I, and I think that even when they expressed private misgivings, which they did to an extraordinary degree. In other words, they agree with the dissenters. They agree with the dissenters. They can't bring themselves to actually follow that uh, line of thinking and begin either negotiations for a kind of fig leaf solution or to, 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 to get out. And so what you find, and this, this, is, uh, you know, this is true, I think, of the French after 1950, 
this is true of the Americans later, that though, they, though the, they, they've stopped believing in the war, you know, in, a, in terms of its importance to French national security considerations, year after bloody year the thing continues because they're not willing to act on those beliefs. Is the implication there that a change in leadership would create more of a, a, a blank slate that could have uh, resulted in policy shifts earlier? I think so. With no sunk cost mentality or no internal I, barriers to rethinking? I, I, think, I think in many, yes, I would say the answer to that is correct. And some have suggested, as you know, Gideon, that you do need a Republican in the White House in January of 69, even though it takes Nixon, arguably, some would say much too long to, to do this. It does change, uh, uh, it does take a new administration to begin to, to, to alter the policies late in the, in the American war, uh, and that, that uh, a Humphrey ticket would have had a harder time doing so. Who knows? But I certainly it's true with respect to the French. And Pierre Mendes Franz comes in, most interesting figure. Mendes Franz comes in in 54, and he's willing to do what his predecessors have not done. And, and Georges Bidot, in particular, is really interesting in this, because Bidot is there sort of from the beginning to the end, uh, and he's so closely associated with this. <coughs> Mendes Franz comes in and says, I'm going to get us out within 30 days, or I resign. And that's what it took. Yes, over here and then over here, next to each other. Rita Hauser, my question follows a little bit. When Robert McNamara was here, whatever the date was, to justify himself on the publication of his book, <laughs> he was met very hostily at that time. But his explanation, which most of us found incredible, was that the US policymakers were unaware of what was Vietnam, and that this was a war of liberation, and there was no knowledge about it, and so on. So I ask you as a historian, did the American academics and policy people not know of all the vast literature in France. I mean, I was a student in France at the time, and there were books galore on Vietnam yeah. and analysis. It was, were the Americans that ignorant of another body of knowledge? And Malcolm, let's tie yours in with that. <laughs> um, Malcolm. <laughs> I thought Rita's question was an excellent one. I can't wait for the answer. Uh, Malcolm Weiner, may I first say that uh, the problem that Gideon noted uh, exists in ancient history as well. Uh, I have two brief questions. One is that during the 1952 campaign, it's been said that the Republican candidate, General Eisenhower, met in New York with Cardinal Spellman, who said that, in fact, uh, he would do everything he could to switch uh, the Catholic vote in New York to the Republicans, uh, uh, but wanted one favor in return. He wanted his protege, Jim, in the Marinol Seminary to be uh, 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 put in charge of Vietnam, so to speak. I wonder first whether you found any evidence of that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, you referred to the fact that the British uh, were very keen initially for us to support the French, but that turned quickly. Oh, yeah. I mean, Anthony Eden begged Foster Dulles not to, uh, and Beatle Smith, not to sabotage the Geneva Accords of 54, and even asked Eisenhower, please, not to appoint Dulles as Secretary of State. Yeah. Uh, let me take those two first. Um, I have not found evidence um, of, uh, in terms of the 52 campaign, any, any kind of agreement, quid pro quo, or uh, anything with respect to what would happen to, uh, to Ziem in terms of U.S. support. When Ziem becomes uh, the leader in 54, I think he does so at least in part because Bao Dai, the emperor, believes that he'll have American backing for this, and that there has been pressure applied by uh, at least implicitly, by the United States on Bao Dai to appoint uh, Ziem. And I think Spellman and various other players are important in <coughs> boosting him uh, in that regard. And so the American connection, I think, is important. I don't know about, um, about, um, uh, about that uh, particular, um, particular case. Your second question was? Oh, the British. Well, yeah, no question that, that uh, um, uh, w uh, a couple of chapters that I will confess I really enjoyed writing had to do with the feud between Dulles and Eden uh, in the spring of 1954. And I think, I think the British role, uh, one of the things we haven't talked about here, but I argue in the book that Eisenhower and Dulles came much closer to military intervention on behalf of the French than has been uh, suggested. 
I think the evidence that I amassed tells me that they were really serious about this. They did say, we're not going to do it without congressional backing, especially this soon after a truce in Korea. This would be a non-starter. We have to have Congress on board. Congress, I think, was willing to go along provided that the British uh, signed off. And so Eden and Churchill become crucial. And one of the things that I detail is the very strong efforts by the Americans to get the British to agree. And Eden, some might say to his credit in historical terms, resists to the nth degree. And it's a really interesting personal feud between the two of them because they come to dislike each other, I think, greatly, but also in terms of the relationship between the two governments. The question about what Americans knew and didn't know, I think, is of, of profound importance. And McNamara is a very interesting figure in all of this because I believe that McNamara privately was an early skeptic, precisely because he knew what was going on. I think even in late Kennedy, so we're talking August, September, October 63, I think if you listen carefully on some of the Kennedy tapes, uh, McNamara is really doubtful that this thing is going to go well. Uh, he says at one point in the tapes, we need a way out of Vietnam. So I think that he's actually very knowledgeable about the problems on the ground. And he's not alone. In fact, I think this is a theme in American officialdom in this period, including Lyndon Johnson himself. And we know this from the Johnson tapes. Kennedy, I think, is a skeptic, as I suggested earlier. So when he comes here a few years ago to suggest that, you know, if only we had known if only we had been aware and known our Vietnamese history, um, you know, I think he sells himself short in a very interesting way, but in a, <laughs> but in a self-serving way. Because in fact, Robert McNamara, uh, I'm not suggesting that they were experts on Vietnam or Vietnamese history, not at all. But believe me, they were not stupid. Believe me, they saw the problems that existed in political terms, in military terms, even with a major U.S. escalation. I don't think Lyndon Johnson thought that the Americanization was going to work, and yet he did it. Uh, and we all know the result in terms of 58,000 American deaths, perhaps 3 million Vietnamese deaths. But your question is, is of great importance, uh, and uh, they knew. They knew. Both academics knew, but senior policymakers knew. So wait, let me just press you on that, because when you say they knew, they obviously knew that there were a hell of a lot of problems and challenges ahead. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a difference between saying yes. they had a can-do spirit which somehow made them think that even in the face of all these challenges they could still somehow eke out a, uh, a positive outcome because we were different from the French or because we had mm -hmm. more positive a can-do spirit or whatever. And saying they knew that it was going to be a failure and they proceeded anyway particularly because yeah. presumably they felt the domestic consequences of acknowledging it before yeah. everybody else acknowledged it would be disastrous. Well, I, and I don't, yes, a good point. So and which I, of those two is it? I don't mean to say that they knew it was going to be a failure. There is no way we can win this thing, but we're going to do it anyway. What, what I guess what I'm suggesting, and it's a, an in the, it's, it's a subtle distinction, a distinction and an important one, I'm glad you, you said this. I think, I think it, was, it was about hope for them, not expectation. They hoped that these measures would work. Uh, and they did have a, a feeling that these pajama-clad gorillas, as they would have said, will not in the end be able to stand up to the, to, 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 to the might of the United States. I just don't sense great conviction in this. In this uh, I think it was more a hope than an expectation. Um, and uh, they um, proceeded accordingly. Now you could say, uh, and, and one of them used the so-called good doctor analogy, <coughs> that you have to be seen as trying to save the patient, in this case South Vietnam, even if the, uh, even if the patient ultimately is going to die, you have to go in and see that, f uh, that, f that you did all you could f in terms of global credibility terms. That, I think, entered into the, the picture, although even there, I think there were more doubts among senior U.S. officials about the importance of the stakes. Lyndon Johnson famous, famously said in one of these tapes, I'm sure you've heard it, um, what the hell is Vietnam worth to me? What's it worth to this country? Um, I don't think it's worth fighting for, and I don't think we can get out. I think he, f I think, I don't think that's just, you know, something he says because the person on the other line, that's what he wants to hear. I think that represents Johnson's position on this. And it's, I think, a troubling finding given what then is about to happen. 
In the back there, yes, in the right. You mentioned the importance of that application, Nixon, please. Sorry, Henry Breed. You mentioned the importance of Nixon winning in '68, and yet the length of time after that mm -hmm. win, before America ultimately withdrew. Do you think that that is a decision, or would have been perceived as a decision that could only be taken in a second term? Um, well, Gideon has written on this. I'd like to know what he thinks. I, I would say. Uh, I would say that one of his concerns, and I think there's good evidence for this, again, I keep coming back to the, to the tapes, and the tapes, like any other uh, source, the tapes have to, have to be used with caution. I don't mean to attach undue importance to the tapes. But the t one of the things that's nice about tapes is that politicians who may or may not forget that the tape is going will say things that they wouldn't put down on paper. You're not going to see a politician on paper generally say, I'm going to do this because if I don't, I won't be reelected. Or I'm going to postpone this for a second term. We do get, I think, tantalizing hints in the tapes that Nixon doesn't want an agreement in Vietnam to happen too soon because he worries that it'll affect his chances in 72 because things, as you know, are building up in 72 in advance of the election. Uh, and Kissinger is making progress in the negotiations. Uh, Nixon, I think, is worried about the timing of all of this, and I think would like for there to be, generally speaking, a status quo. He wants an agreement by then, I believe. I don't know if Gideon agrees, but I think he's, uh, he's concerned about those electoral implications. So I would at least say this, that he sees all Vietnam options through the lens of his election. That's arguably not as dramatic as it sounds. This is what politicians do. We shouldn't be, you know, shocked by this as long as it's not as, as it's not the only thing that's motivating him. But I think he is thinking about it in yes, in second term terms. I disagree slightly uh, in the sense that I think that you have to distinguish between the first Nixon strategy and the second Nixon strategy. He comes in thinking like so many other presidents do mm -hmm. that if he just rejiggers things, uh, he can actually achieve the goals his predecessors were trying to achieve. Uh, uh, with a different sort of set of strategic things, and Kissinger certainly thinks that he is a better negotiator and can do the results. They realize by the fall of 69 that's not going to happen, and they really have this heart-to-heart -heart thinking in the fall of 69 about what's going to happen next. And at that point, they put themselves on a glide path out. Um, I actually think he wants it substantially accomplished by the election so he can get credit in the run-up to the election that, look, I actually have gotten us out in a very Obama-esque kind of way. Uh, not so much the Vietnam Obama, the Iraq Obama, but the Afghanistan. Look, I've put us on a glide path out. Mm -hmm. The details of when the final thing occurs, he wants it to occur sort of not so much before the election that any bad things that happen happen right away. But they actually are trying to do that in the details of how things play out. They would have been happy to have it happen in before the election in 70, uh, late 72, the uh, two does it. Um, the difference, the really interesting question there is, what do they think that's going to happen after the accords? Um, and I think they don't actually, they leave, they leave it open. For me, the key thing with the Paris Accords is the fight continues with the U.S. extricating itself, exactly, for example, as what's going to happen in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And the interesting question there is whether you could have had a significantly different outcome much earlier. The reason I want him to write his book on the end of the war is Fred thinks that you could have had a somewhat better, uh, an, equal, an, an outcome no worse than what you got much earlier. Uh, I just don't buy that because um, I think all those, uh, and I think the people who think you could have gotten, as they famously say, you could have gotten 73 and 69 uh, are wrong. You could have gotten 75 in 69, but, the, but there was a chance that 73 wouldn't turn into 75. And the interesting question that I want to see you write the book about is showing how you could have withdrawn substantially quicker in, the Nixon, in Nixon's first term and not produced 75 right away. Uh, and that's an interesting question. But uh, uh, with that, let me just take one last question, and then we, I'm sure he'll stay for a little bit more uh, over here, and then we'll just uh, finish up. Thank you. Inger Elliott, I am Limited. I recently saw a documentary uh, about the early days of colonial, or the late days of colonialism in Hanoi. Everyone dressed in beautiful white and so forth, and everyone speaking French, et cetera, et cetera, leading up to Dien Bien Phu and to the end of Dien Bien Phu with the French soldiers being marched off 
and the narrator saying, and what was left, of course, were all the armaments, which, of course, the Americans had provided. Mm -hmm. Was that true? Uh, well, the first thing I would say is that I'm interested in this documentary. I don't think I know about this documentary. So if I could, uh, 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 sounds, sounds really interesting. Uh, oh, no question that uh, there were huge amounts of armaments really throughout Indochina. So we're not talking just about Vietnam, which the French had divided into three sections, uh, Tonkin, Annam, and Cochin, China. There's also a lot of, of, of French uh, armaments supplied in many cases by the Americans in Cambodia and Laos. Um, and that's something that the French and also their American advisors grapple with and have to figure out how to deal with. Uh, a lot of that uh, weaponry uh, comes into then the hands of the, of the, of the North Vietnamese military after, after the agreements. And some of it is used uh, a decade later against Americans, no question. And before then is used against Vietnamese revolutionaries or, or against the, uh, the Xiem regime's forces, the so-called Arvin uh, Army of the Republic of Vietnam, <coughs> even in the late 50s and, and early 1960s. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of weapons, no question. Uh, to paraphrase uh, a comment of uh, uh, John Stewart's on the Book of Mormon, uh, this book is so good it makes me angry. Um, uh, with that, we're going to close. Let me just say that since there are so many questions that we can continue, I'm going to hereby propose from the platform uh, to, uh, to the council uh, that are here uh, that you know, it would be entirely appropriate to do a Arthur Ross Book Award winner book club uh, because the books that we have uh, been giving this prize to are so damn good that they uh, cannot be contained, the discussion about them can't be contained in one uh, session with the author, and I would be happy to help uh, coordinate a, uh, an ongoing, you know, special uh, 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 award uh, committee book club. Anyway, Fred Logoval, Embers of War.